Um, you're all very welcome. We'll just let people come in. Pull up a chair. Get their drinks ready. I just I'll start talking when the when the numbers calm down a little bit. Okay, so um, I think I'll kick off. Still got up. I think I'll kick off anyway. And uh, as they say, don't be out of the the late. And uh, we are live streaming, so everybody is very welcome on yet another busy day in the world of the WPATH files. Um, and uh, we, we've been extraordinary um, lucky to have such good numbers. I, I thought there was only 800, but there's over a thousand people last week and there was over two, well over 2000 the week before. So the, we had phenomenal numbers between all the live streaming, all the different pa platforms. So everybody's very welcome to this third webinar about the WPATH files. The focus today is on the doctors and we're going to we're going to go around and introduce the doctors and the and the physicians in a moment. But first of all, I just want to hear Carrie and Mia's um, thoughts about the kerfuffle today, because it was all very exciting. <laughs> WPATH was exciting today. <laughs> go first. Yeah, go on. So a lot of it happened before I even got myself out of bed and ready and, and all the excitement was underway. Mm -hmm. There was the, the website, everything had disappeared from the website. Um, I didn't really know what to make of it. I learned my lesson not to jump the gun, not to jump to conclusions and to just wait and see and see what, what's really going on. So I stayed quiet publicly. I didn't say anything. I did find, you see, that there was a statement or, or an internal Marcy Bowers statement, right, that then wow. surfaced. But that's from, I believe, last week. I did find that rather amusing because um, there was about my report was it, it called my report darkly drafted. I think was the the wording. Marcy said that the the WPATH files report was darkly drafted and then dismissed it as being misinformation and actually cited Erin Reed. So we've got a supposedly world professional healthcare group citing a non-medical trans activist who I tried to go through what Erin said about my report and uh, the the errors that that he was pointing out just were not errors they were they just weren't errors and he said he found 216 and he shared about 15 of them and none of them were really errors and i don't know what the others even are so yeah it's been yet another eventful day in the life of the wpath files what did you make of it carrie uh similar i mean i just was struck as a as a physician that that um memo or letter that marcy bowers wrote you know from last week as you said was really that same theme of you know attacking people instead of discussing mm -hmm. the substance or acknowledging you know that there are concerns and so that that activist style of engaging with you know criticism or concerns around health issues is really alarming to all of us as physicians because it's it's safety first. And then, of course, you know, quoting Aaron Reed it, it is not a physician. Um, and again, you pointed out her criticism, but it was talking about your report. She, to my knowledge, didn't get into the substance of the meta, of the the files or the vignettes talking about medical actual issues. So again, to for for where WPATH, the leader, to cite that seems, you know, not where we, we want everything to go in terms of, of safety and quality concern. So, yeah, that was shocking. But uh, yeah, uh, uh, I, I was there more in real time because it was happening early. You know, I'm five hours ahead or four or whatever ahead he is. And it was very exciting. But I did think this is so out of character that, like, their website suddenly re reverted to 2019. And I'm like, this crowd don't back down. They brazen out. You know what I mean? That's their calling card is being brazen in the face of, you know. And as you said, Carrie, 
using words and evocative statements and then declaring it scientific. It's, 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 it's very double speak and it's, it's very discombobulating. But um, it was classic. But they do seem to be rattled very much, I'd say, by uh, the WPAT files. Their slightly frantic message on their homepage saying, please be advised, our website is currently experiencing an internal system issue and we are currently working to restore it. <laughs> In capital letters, it does look slightly panicked. And so they should be. I think they've been revealed by Mia's report and by Michael Schellenberger's work and the internal files They've been revealed to be a, an extraordinarily harmful organisation that are not scientific, they're not medical. And we're going to talk to the medics tonight to discuss exactly that. What we might do is go around, first of all, maybe um, Eitan, then Mark, Laurie, and then over to Roy. Just a quick introduction, because I want to hear a little bit from Roy but before he has to leave. So if you, first of all, Eitan, just introduce yourself and then we'll move on. Yeah. Hi there, everyone. Uh, thanks for letting me be a part of it. My name is Aton Heim. Uh, I'm a the whistleblower from Texas Children's Hospital. It's a privilege to be a part of it. Um, it's just a disclaimer to that I'm on call, so uh, I might have to just mute my video uh, just to take a phone call, and if trauma comes in, I might have to leave abruptly. But just FYI. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Mark Buchanan. I'm a uh, retired physician, but in my retirement, I teach medical ethics at a um, school in the Northeast, which for the moment I think shall remain nameless. And I've encountered all sorts of interesting adventures in trying to introduce some, shall I say, different voices on the issue of trans care for youth. Great. I'm, I can't wait to hear um, some some of the things you said. I loved we had Eitan on the podcast. So I, 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 I know your story, but I can't wait to hear about the medical ethics because I think actually medical ethics are going to be the the, the issue of the 21st century. I, I really think it's the it's 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 as hot. It used to be for me in Ireland, Catholic Ireland, medical ethics equaled abortion, but now it equals everything. There's so many other issues. So we'll get more into that later. Laurie, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm Laurie Regan Streif. I'm a Canadian physician uh, working in Ontario, um, and I do quite a little, quite a bit of evidence review for continuing education for other family physicians and a lot of mentoring of other family physicians. And I actually have become a member of WPATH about three or four years ago because I had done an evidence review uh, for, it wasn't for gender affirming care at the time, it was for care of transgender adults. And when we went into the evidence review, I realized that I needed to know more. So I joined the listserv thinking that I would learn more, all the inside stuff that maybe wasn't getting published. Yeah, yeah. There's so much research that has been out since then. It's extraordinary. It's like we're, 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 we've got so much information finally. None of it long term, most of it short term, but some of it really is high quality. And we have CAS. Just in case any of us think we're going to be relaxing for the next few weeks, we have Cass on the way. So that's going to be, you know, a suite of research that we'll be able to use, independent research that we can look forward to. So, Roy, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and take the, take the, the you know, floor, because I know you're going to be um, leaving soon. So I'm Roy Epen. I'm an endocrinologist in Montreal. Uh, I'm associated with the university, which which will also name, will remain nameless for the instant. Um, and I've written an, a number of articles in the Wall Street Journal and in not, a, a couple of other places. Um, my initial concern was the guidelines, the guidelines from both the Endocrine Society and the American uh, Academy of Pediatrics. And um, we actually, um, I, I belong to a group called Do No Harm. And we went, we are a medical watchdog uh, organization, and we went to the Endocrine Society and we set up a booth and we started talking to endocrinologists from all over the world. And when we were telling them what was going on with, uh, with uh, gender care in children, many of them were, were on our side. They thought that, that this was uh, very unusual that we were doing, that people were doing these kind of things. Um, and so we wrote an article about that experience in the Wall Street Journal. And for some un un inexplicable reason, the president of the Endocrine Society decided to uh, reply to me and say that I didn't know what I was talking about. So 
so which gave us an opportunity to uh, reply and, and say, you know, there are multiple systematic reviews saying that, uh, that the evidence for all of these uh, things is poor. And, um, and then, then there was an article from 21 endocrinologists and other specialists from around the world uh, agreeing with us. And I think the WPATH files have sort of uh, confirmed what, you know, I, I, I thought was going on, but it's even more shocking than that. It's, it's shocking in the sense that, you know, they know these problems are there and they don't really seem to care much about them. They know that uh, the, the informed consent is a real problem with these children. I mean, some of the comments that, that were made, you know, uh, it's, it's like talking to kids before they've actually even taken a high school biology course and then asking them whether or not they want to be infertile. Um, you know, they, they talk about, you know, uh, children not ever having an orgasm. I mean, you know, these are, these are things that are basic to humanity. And uh, it's, it's, it's sort of shocking that they, they say these things and, and, and rather flippantly. So, you know, the WPATH files, I think, have, have revealed that this is not a scientific organization, but it is indeed an, an, act, an organization which has a, a scientific veneer, a scientific beard, um, and is, is really an activist organization. And they have their own activist uh, agenda, which is not the best interest of the children. I think uh, that's a, s such an important point that this does not feel like the the clinicians in these reports have the best interests. Did you feel that, Mia, when you were writing it up? Because you, you're kind of the, the expert for life on the WPATH files. There, yeah, I mean, there's a complete lack of concern for all of the, 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 the terrible side effects, the debilitating vaginal atrophy, the, 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 the males who are suffering from terrible um, sexual issues. There's just yet yeah, nobody nobody shows any concern whatsoever for the their iatrogenic effects, right? Like these people are the ones causing the yeah. medical treatment itself is causing all of these problems. Whatsoever. And yet all that you see in the files is these these people just guessing how to deal with it. What can we do? Oh, I tried this, I tried this. They're just improvising, they're just experimenting. And I, I, as far as I could see, nobody shows even the slightest concern for the actual long-term health and well-being of their patients. And Roy, did you say that you tried to work with the Endocrine Society? And how how is your what is your feeling that how will they be feeling now? Because if I was them, I'd be professionally embarrassed. So. Um... Just recently, the Endocrine Society uh, announced uh, they were going to they were setting up a new guidelines committee. They've been promising this for quite some time. The last guidelines were set up in 2017, um, and the head of the the new guidelines committee is uh, a doctor from Mount Sinai who is uh, enmeshed in WPATH. And I'm, I'm it will be interesting. I don't know who the, all the other members are, but it's going to be interesting to see if uh, these members are all going to be involved with WPATH as well. WPATH basically has written the guidelines for both the Endocrine Society and the AAP, essentially. There were six members of WPATH on the, uh, on the Endocrine Society 2017 guidelines. Um, and I'm, I, it's going to be, you know, if, if the Endocrine Society and the, the American Academy of Pediatrics Society are, are smart, they will distance themselves from these uh, uh, these members of their committee and get actual members of, of of their of their large communities to get involved in this and 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 publish real guidelines, which uh, the guidelines should say that we probably shouldn't do most of these things in, in in children, as as our European colleagues are saying now. Yeah, what do you think, uh, Carrie? Do you think that the uh, the endocrine crowd society will will change what's the word their core their horses in let's change <laughs> well gosh yeah it's it's a conundrum right i mean it, it, we've all been working towards you know raising awareness putting pressure on them as roy eloquently said to 
have more balanced committees, not to just blindly follow, you know, WPATH, which clearly is is activist organization. Um, so I don't know. I, I do, you know, as, as probably most of our audience knows, the American Academy of Pediatrics is being sued. Um, and, you know, I wonder how the WPATH files will impact, you know, uh, what lawyers are looking into as really kind of, you know, I'm not using the proper legal terms, but almost like a coercive environment, you know, where um, because WPATH has got control over these associations, we're all saying the same thing. And that's been impacting a lot of uh, impacting care across our country in the United States. I, I think um, to answer your question, I think if there's, um, you know, a legal lever here to pull, I think that's probably going to um, be quite impactful. I, I don't know if other the other physicians have have thoughts on on that. So how to how to move the association, so to speak. Well, yeah, unmute yourself, maybe Mark, you look like you've you've thoughts. <laughs> yeah, in preparation for this talk, I trolled around the the web a little bit. I looked at the websites for organizations that have depended on WPATH in the past to see if they were posting any notice that they might be taking another look. So I went to the American Psychiatric Association, the Academy of Pediatrics, the Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychology, didn't find anything. And, you know, maybe they just don't know. You know, there's a universe of what I'd call news aggregators for doctors. There's Medscape, Kaiser Family Foundation, Health News, modern health care. And I looked at some of these and see that typically they've done 10 or 15 articles on gender dysphoria and treatment of it in the last 12 or 15 months. So they might be sort of interested. Nothing, absolutely nothing. Wow. I think from what everybody is talking about, I'd be interested in, in what Laurie or Eitan has to say about this. To reverse medical protocols appears to be a very difficult thing to do. You might know better. What do you think, Aitan? Yeah, you, you know, I think that um, it's really, there's an interesting correlation to an important event in the past. You know, when I was going through the WPATH files, you know, it, it, was, it seemed to me that WPATH was kind of emerging as like this cartel of medical negligence where they launder their phony, bogus recommendations through their members to other organizations. So you have, like, for example, Dr. Satterwhite, the guy who owns this big surgical clinic in California, a member of WPATH, who also sits on the, rec uh, on the recommendation board for the Endocrine Society. So you have their recommendations being laundered to other organizations. But when you look at the WPATH files, one thing that really stands out is you have this internal sense of hesitancy behind closed doors where they're really expressing these major issues with the interventions they're pursuing. And this contrasts so heavily to their public expressions of authoritative control, like of confidence. And what this relates to in the past is what you saw with opioids where behind closed doors, these people were really questioning, like, we're giving an entire generation of people these addictive medications. Like, should we really be doing this? You had people in the Sackler family being like, oh, you know, is this a good idea? But those private expressions of hesitancy were stored away. And then on the public, the public uh, uh, facing organization, said, no, this is safe, this is effective, these are the protocols. They used their recommendations that they developed that were phony and bogus, and they laundered them into all the other medical societies so that they create this perception of consensus. And when people speak up, like I remember Dr. Mendoza, I remember the first time we spoke, you know, you told me stories about how you would challenge this idea of giving people these powerful opioids, but but you would get so much pushback because there was this false appearance of consensus. And the question is, how do we, how do we break this 
this um, like uh, internal consistency, like this internal mechanism of control. And the one thing we learned with the opioid epidemic is that it was broken once criminal prosecutions began to occur. And I think that, it, especially with W pathology, especially with everything we're learning, that has to be the next route. Because when these people understand that if they're going to mutilate and castrate, sterilize these children, if there's going to be a possibility of prison time, they're going to definitely think twice about that. It's just like with the opioid epidemic too. As a matter of interest, all of you, I, I don't know, maybe maybe not yourself, Aitam, but the rest of you, I presume, worked during the opioid epidemic. You just look very fresh-faced. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I'd I'd imagine the rest of you worked during. I know, <laughs> I know you did, Carrie. But um, how much was it among were people talking? Were people having webinars like we were about the opioid epidemic? If you follow me, because there was an unfolding medical scandal. Were people talking about it? Um, unmute yourself, maybe Laurie, if you've got something to say about it. Was it in the conversation among doctors? It. There was a definitely a parallel. I'm going back to the early 2000s now where a newbie doctor or somebody just coming into, let's say they're just coming into practice, general practice, um, and they're seeing lots of people with back pain or some kind of routine chronic pain presentation who seem to be persistently needing or wanting to have an opioid. And the, um, the general, like, a new doctor coming in might think, oh, I'm, I'm really not familiar with this. I'm going to call up a pain specialist or I'm going to turn to my pain mentor and ask them. And the that's the, as Stephen Levine talks about, the chain of um, trust where you would turn to a more senior physician and ask them, um, you know, what would you do about this case? I have this case. I'm really not sure what to do with it. This person's starting to use a lot of opioids and so on. So there was that kind of picture but what we see, I think, here and what we're actually seeing this with our second opioid crisis, which we're running into in Canada, is the juniors, like the junior, they may be physicians or they may even be social workers or non-experts with lived experience or counselors who are telling the doctors what to do. So this is a unique experience in, in Canada where uh, short-acting opioids like hydromorphone are now being prescribed to people as a safer supply to um, replace the toxic uh, fentanyl supply. But what you're, we're finding now is it's almost a reverse chain where juniors are telling the physicians or their mentors or their teachers how to talk about it, what to say, what to do, how to prescribe. I've I've sat and watched a one-year physician tell a 15 or 20-year physician how to prescribe hydromorphone tablets to somebody who's injecting fentanyl, and my jaw was on the floor. So it's really, it's flipped in some ways, uh, but it's also similar in the sense that when people started to get uncomfortable, they weren't always sure where to turn. Who do I ask? Because these are the people promoting pain medication and telling me I should be managing this fifth vital sign and yet I'm feeling uncomfortable managing this fifth vital sign for this particular patient and a lot of physicians feeling uh, isolated in their own little clinic with their own little problems not realizing that they were having there were parallel experiences going on for many other physicians in their clinics as well with the, their questions about the opioids and not knowing what to do so maybe more isolated than this it's so similar. Before, um, I would like to catch Roy before you have to go, because I know you have to go, but I do want to hear what Mia says afterwards about medical scandals, because I know you make a lot of parallels. But um, Roy, what, what would you have to say before you go? Because I know you have to go about, let's say, the opioid or the parallels around what's going on here. So um, we're actually going through a new opioid crisis in Canada. The, the, the government is gotten into this, especially in, in one of our provinces, British Columbia, into this harm reduction thing, which I think is actually sort of similar to this whole, this whole uh, crisis in, the, in, the, in, in, in gender treatment for children, in that they are now giving out huge amounts of, of, uh, of uh, hydromorphone to uh, people who are then, uh, who are supposed to use it 
but instead they sell it and then th those tablets are sold now to, to children and other people. So again, you know, the government seems to want to do some good stuff, but doesn't know how, how to. I mean, I think what we seem to have forgotten that, you know, our, our primary duty is to protect our children. Wow. It's frightening, really. Thank you very much for your, your contribution and thanks for, for being able to join up. Um, Mia, what, what do you make of all that? Because you're, you're, you've are you really studied the scandal. And afterwards, we might go to yourself, Carrie. Thank you very much, Roy, um, about the not only the opioid, but what you were talking about medical marijuana. And there's there's more than one crisis going on. There's overprescription of children in general. There's overmedication of children in general. But first of all, Mia, what, what do you make of all that? Well, I actually have a question for the, the doctors who are present. So uh, because I've been looking into this, I'm, I don't know if I've talked about this in a podcast recently. I'm not sure which one where I do have that. When I read about the, the harm that these doctors are doing and when I listen to the stories of detransitioners, I do feel that really strong impulse that these people belong behind bars, that we, you know, we need to lock them up. And so I, I looked into, I was looking into past scandals, trying to find if there were any cases, instances where doctors were actually criminally charged. And so I did find that the, the hormone therapy scandal that I wrote about in the report, the when they were trying to correct the height of tall girls and short boys, the short boy scandal when they were giving them human growth hormone and it was contaminated with Creutzfeldt Jakob disease and then many of the, the the kids ended up dying of this horrible brain wasting disease and in France I think four or five doctors were criminally charged with manslaughter because they continued to prescribe the the, the human growth hormone after they were aware of the CJD risk they were not they were found guilty but they were given suspended sentences and then the only other instance I found was um, in the East German doping scandal, when they were giving they were giving the teenage girls um, testosterone in pill form, but they were telling them that it was vitamins. They weren't telling them that it was testosterone, and those doctors were criminally charged with causing bodily harm to a minor. Um, and I think they did end up in prison. It's, it, it's a different place. And then opioid to me is they were the criminal element was prescription fraud. Am I right? It was it was not causing harm to the patients, but it was illegally writing prescriptions to addicts. So is is there another aspect of like of have I missed anything or did I get that wrong about opioids? Like. It's very rare that doctors face criminal charges, right? You know, I, I think a good example, um, potential way to pursue this forward is the the story of Dr. Death in Dallas. He was a neurosurgeon in Dallas who operated on people where um, there were no indications. So, you know, if someone had a back issue or a spine issue, he would take them to the operating room, implant uh, hardware that didn't need to be implanted. He operated on his best friend who ended up you know, suffering just severe complications. And he's, he's in prison right now. Um, so it's, if, you know, if I were to operate on someone tomorrow, you know, they came into my clinic and they say, I, I want my arm chopped off because I believe I was born disabled. I would go to prison. You know, there's no doubt about that. So, I, the laws are already on the books, but there's this um, Overton window that's been shifted, and we just allow this criminal behavior to persist, um, but uh, uh, because it's that Overton window that's shifted. Wow. And don't forget, we're taking Q&A, and we will address them in the, the, the second half of the webinar. Could each of you comment on Mia's question? Because I think it's a really powerful and important question to address oh, yeah go ahead let me jump in uh, another doctor who's in prison serving life without parole is Kermit Gosnell who was the abortion provider of last resort in Philadelphia and he practiced in a very very pro-choice environment the governor protected him 
but he was convicted of delivering or aborting babies who were well past the 24-week line. And if they were born breathing, he would take a pair of scissors and snip their spinal cord, uh, instantly killing them. He did that on several occasions. He also negligently killed one of the women who came in uh, for an abortion. That is certainly the outlier. You think about other scandals. Think of all the lobotomies that were done. I don't believe anybody went to prison for doing lobotomies. It just sort of fell out of favor, maybe because Thorazine came in to replace it. Or the, the ongoing scandal at Tuskegee with the syphilis experiments. Nobody went to prison. I don't think anybody lost their license. Nobody was disciplined. It all just sort of got buried along with the victims of the study. Wow, that is so I funny. Just, I'm going to yeah. add to that because um, one of the things that I think we were all, I remember this really well, Carrie, you've brought it up, I think, is that you were given, you know, pain scales, for example, and your, the expectation was for you guys for a different reason. You have more of a consumer-driven situation where our, ours is more about service and quality or whatever you want to call it, but um, somebody... You, your goal was to get them to a four or a five on the smiley face scale. You know, basically the very first emojis were probably invented by girls. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and these were then put into, you know, above people's bedsides after surgery in the post-op spaces and so on. And the expectation as a physician prescribing, though, was, as you can imagine, to do a good job, which was to make the patient a four or a five. So... To be fair, there's a huge number of physicians out there, I believe, and having come from, um, I'm now in exile from a Facebook Women in Medicine page um, in Canada, I can see exactly how they function. They don't know what they're doing. They ask someone else. Someone else says, well, I did it this way the last time that came my way. <laughs> Not unlike what I saw in the listserv, the WPATH listserv, but a real case of the blind leading the blind. But they genuinely, most of them think they're like on a mission to save this sort of out of the blue marginalized subgroup of humans that have suddenly appeared on the planet. And before, well, they were all under a rock crying or something. We know that they weren't all committing suicide because we don't have those numbers. But, um, you know, I think that many of them, many of the what we would call the middle middle management, I suppose, uh, really think they're doing the right thing. I've certainly had conversations with colleagues who are all in on this and they just don't know anything else. That Most of them are very new. They didn't live through the opioid crisis. Those are the ones that are doing the harm reduction prescribing that Roy was talking about in Canada, the safer supply. They're young. They're um, a psychologist in Toronto once wrote something, an article that was very controversial, got him into a lot of trouble. Something about they're Chelsea boots, wearing Chelsea boots. Now, we all wear a lot, you know, these Flintstones, right? We all, we all wear them. But, you know, we, she was riding a bike in her Chelsea boots, and he was talking about interviewing a physician who was doing this work. But what he was trying to say, really, is that it's a sort of a social justice, you know, component of medicine that is really attracting a lot of new doctors. And so it's being now taught to first-year medical students that this is the right way to deliver care, which is where it gets... No, a little bit nerve wracking to watch. Wow. Yeah. And I think just to build on that, when it's so pervasive, you know, it's not like you're going to see, you know, entire hospital executives and entire, you know, medical groups going to jail. You know, it's what, what it has happened is, and it happened in the opiate crisis, is it got built into the regulations in, in the states. And then they have all these, um, you know, business mechanisms of the way medicines run here. So what Lori was saying, you know, like your patient, ex your patient experience scores or, or what patient feedback has been given about you can be part of a formula of what your like bonus will be, you know, so that stuff like that should be illegal, but it's like, that's part of the mechanism that I think was this, this culture of doctors kind of just the force to say yes to things that they, when they started questioning the immense force of the regulatory state upon them, 
they would just figure out like, well, maybe I'll just write a few pills. You know, this is like from the ER, which is obviously, you know, different than if you're in the doctor's office. But, you know, just the vast regulatory state had built into it that, you know, pain control was a quality metric and it was how the hospital and doctor's groups did was based on reimbursements. So you can see how it all got scaled up. But I never, I never saw, so the AMA never apologized about the opioid crisis. They had a big hand in it because they partnered with um, Purdue Pharma on some quality metric studies early on around like 2000 and that then blossomed into these other things that got built into the regulations. And, you know, so um, what, what I did see, of course, you know, what have impacted me was more when the patients got angry and it was scary. Like I had to have security to walk me out to my car a few times after shifts because these people were addicts. And when you'd say no to them, which I did, so I never wrote inappropriate scripts saying no, that people would get so enraged, you know, and there were, there had been doctors that have gotten shot because they wouldn't, you know, refill prescriptions. Um, but I never saw, you know, anyone at the level of like instituting, continuing to enforce the regulations, um, you know, ever apologize or get called into questions. It's kind of like the housing market crash that happened, right? There were a lot of people, a lot of those people never, again, you know, were, um, it all held account. So, I mean, I haven't, I haven't, you know, seen, seen that. And I think with the gender issue, it's so pervasive built into regulations. It's like asking someone's gender is like the sixth vital sign now, right? You know, it's built into the electronic health record. For now. Yeah. Right. For now I'm working on that, but I mean, it's so pervasive. So um, I think that uh, the the lawsuits are going to help bring it down, like we've talked about, um, which it happened with the opioid crisis. Prescription drug monitoring definitely came in there before the first lawsuits, which gave doctors what I call digital moral courage. They could say, well, I looked in the computer and it says X, Y, Z. And, and it, they had a reason to like push back on the people asking for prescriptions. So I, I feel that's kind of a policy thing that's going to need to happen with this because we need to figure out policy levers that a lot of these clinicians out there feel they and they need to say no, basically, and we need to help figure that out. I'd like to reiterate anybody, anybody listening, and there's many, many people listening in the various platforms, we can do our bit by writing to our local clinic and saying, I see you have the WPATH files on your references and they have been discredited take a look at this file take mm -hmm. a look at you know Mia's report um you know put them on the back foot you know with your own letters we're going to do a campaign anyway with Genspec and help people out on that but I, I think anybody can write that in I do want to say I, I there was a big scandal in Ireland um I'm thinking of a certain you know Irish surgeon that's kind of infamous in gender circles, Side Gallagher, and she's, you know, she's Irish and she's making a mint clearly in America. But there was another, funnily enough, she's from, she's from, as far as I know, she's from uh, County Loud or somewhere near there. And there was a very famous scandal of a surgeon in County Loud, a different surgeon, Dr. Michael Neary, and he removed the womb of 129 women straight after, yeah. He was obviously some form of a psychopath. So generally it was straight after delivery of having a baby and he, he got struck off, but it took a long time for him to get struck off. And then he retired in full pension, ended over in a half million, you know, pound villa in Spain, then ended up coming back to Ireland. And it was like, this is in real time. He, he's still alive as far as I know, you know, in Ireland. So, um, Eitan, you know, the, the surgeons, what What's the what's the conversations around the fact that Sive is there on TikTok eating the teats and stuff like that? Do people bring it up, or like what would happen if you brought it up to other surgeons? Uh, you, you know, it's we would we would bring it up, but we would find quiet corners of the hospital that we can, you know, escape away to and talk about these things because 
there's such a pervasive culture of censorship that prevents any of this from being brought up. And you don't even have to explain why. Everyone knows that if you do talk about it, you know, there's a good chance you're going to have severe repercussions at your job. Either you're going to get fired, you know, you're not going to get um, uh, promoted and then you're going to get fired. You're not going to get published. You're going to get ostracized within your job. I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's hard to overstate how, how little conversation happens in these academic medical centers. The only conversations that happen are how to promote it, how to integrate it, and how to further its goals. The conversations are never directed towards, is this a good idea? Because at that point, it's already been accepted. And then when you have anyone who even questions it, they're being gaslighted into believing that there is this consensus that already exists. And when you atomize the individual, when you isolate them, then they don't feel confident to express these things publicly. But you know, I, I, I believe that if you had even a few people who are willing to during these meetings, more people would start speaking up because inherently all of us know this is wrong. Even the people who are doing it know it's wrong, but in many ways they've gone too far down that road that if they express any type of self-reflection, they will come to the conclusion that they were the ones who are harming these children the most, you know, and they were doing it for their own self-righteousness. Well, um, what, what would the medical ethicists say, Mark? Well, I certainly have seen that in my own institution. About five years ago, I saw some things that were being taught about gender medicine that kind of didn't make sense to me. I didn't really know anything about the field at the time. So using the internal school email, I sent a message to a tenured professor who was near the end of his career saying, hey, you're a specialist in this area. What do you think? The reply was, uh, maybe we should have this conversation in person rather than by email. And then I, I know another person who works in the, the sort of pediatric adolescent mental health delivery system of a nearby institution who said, yeah, I, I don't I, I don't buy any of that stuff. I don't do it myself. In fact, I talk to peers about it and they they'll say the same thing. They'll say, yeah, I agree with you, but you can't say that here. Well, what's the protocol? Imagine if you're you're somebody and you're saying, I don't buy this. And then the patient is in front of you and they're seeking a mastectomy and they're seeking your kind of say so. How, how does a do can a doctor be a conscientious objector in that context? Well, that depends. The legislature of Connecticut is currently looking at a bill. It's sort of, they have this non-discrimination bill right now where you can't discriminate against people for you know, it, it's the usual, it's race, sex. And it says, so for purposes of this, sex means sex, uh, sexual orientation, and gender identity, and it means medical care given for that. So there are no age restrictions on that. So as I read the bill, it would mean that you must offer gender-affirming care to kids of any age without any input from their parents, and with no right of conscience, or forget conscience, what about medical opinion? Suppose your medical opinion is that this would be bad care, but the hope of some is to make that illegal in our state. Wow. Any comments on that? I might go to some of the Q&A because there's a few come in. Do you want to make any comment on that, Mia or, or Carrie? No, I, I just think it's it's just a you know there's again a, a culture um, and and legislation through like the civil rights channels that have the activists have gotten into to enforce their policy prescriptions, but it's it's butt up against you know ethical safe care and the thought in in medicine 
that you can't speak up about a safety issue is just the opposite of everything that we learn and is about, at least like in the hospital, the way I practice in my environment, everything is about safety. So to think that there is a section of, of healthcare that's carved out away from be people being able to raise concerns is just is just so distressing and again to take it back to the files as as was said there's the public face um versus you know the internal where there's just questions people asking questions about the basic fundamental medical decision making on these cases that they're acting publicly that they know all the answers to, but yet internally they're asking basic questions like, how do I care for this patient? What, what am I supposed to do? When is the right time for surgery? So th that, that, those are huge red flags. And, you know, if I could add one thing to that yeah. too, um, you know, when you look at the, the um, conference in the WPATH files, the the one case that I believe could be made towards potential criminal medical negligence is when you have them expressing their concerns, right, about, um, you know, the effects of puberty blockers causing, like, menopause-like symptoms, stealing the sexual development of these kids, like Dr. Metzger said, um, or, or people with uh, psychiatric issues that really affect their daily living. But in each case, instead of, you know, uh, demonstrating like this cautious uh, behavior that a doctor should, should, that should be inherent in any doctor, they just go more into medications, surgery. So in, instead of being cautious when a problem exists, when a challenge exists, which is the fundamental principle in medicine and surgery is like when you're faced with an unknown, the first thing you should do is be cautious to do less, to, to not do anything invasive. But in every case where there's a challenge or something that they didn't expect, they go every time into more and more powerful medications. Um, like like one, one of the younger, I, th I think she was an endocrinologist. Yeah. Uh, she, She's like, oh, yeah, well, this person has all these issues. Uh, you know, we'll just do spirulina lactone. We'll just do that, you know, instead of being like, hey, how about we pause, right? Yeah. Um, and, and that that in itself is criminal negligence. I, I mean, that's if I did that, you know, I would lose my license um, because it's so obvious. And here we have a video of them saying it themselves. And that's what struck me when I was going through is, it, it, it was so profoundly shocking that it's like, man, you have these people who are, they're just saying it openly and, and it, it counters so much what they say publicly that, that uh, it's almost unbelievable. But these days, yeah. the unbelievable is what has become the norm. And you could almost ring the police on them and say, this video shows that they, <laughs> you know what I mean? This is, this, this is negligent. Some of the questions are, are, oh, Mia, come on in, because some of the questions are interesting as well, but come on in, and Laurie too. I'm going to repeat myself from what I said, I think it was last week, that um, those the clinicians, those panel members are apparently the internal heroes of WPATH. So Benjamin Ryan did that great piece about the WPATH files and actually got statements from inside WPATH and Laura edwards Leeper told Benjamin Ryan that the panel members are the heroes. They are the internal heroes. They were grappling with the ethical dilemmas of treating this difficult patient cohort, and they were advocating for the better, appropriate, more appropriate care. And that would, I think I said it last week, that would work if they were not actually placing these kids onto this exper this experimental and irreversible medical treatment that, that they are actually talking about if they were inside WPATH calling for an immediate end to this crazy experiment that they obviously know is doing harm, then sure, they'd be the heroes. But they're saying all this stuff, they see all the problems exactly the way we see them, and then they carry on business as usual.
horrifying. It's literally horrifying. Do you want to comment before we go to a uh, uh, questions, Laurie? No, no. I was. I had a comment about something that's like three topics back. Was I'm. I'm oh, fine for now. I'll wait and see if it comes back. No, it's fine. I'm good. No, 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 go for it. Go for it. Yeah, go for oh, the no, it. Was, things to say. It yeah, was, it was about what I think what Etan was saying about um, well, who was saying it or maybe Carrie about they, you know, they they came along the all the regulation that happened after they kind of decided to kind of come down on the opioid prescribing because somebody was you were talking about um random prescribing and pill mills and physicians doing that but some of it was just very patient driven which is very familiar to us in this conversation where the patient is deciding and directing the physician and that's what's happening with the safe supply maneuver now is people are coming in saying well 30 hydromorphone tablets today is not enough for me i need 35 and then a week or two later i need 40. Um, those are eight milligram tablets from my doctor colleagues and those would be a day that are dispensed to people um, so what happened in, in in Canada and also in the States is the new guide, we had new guidelines that came out that said, okay, well, uh, you can only prescribe chronic, for chronic pain up to 90 milligrams. That's the cutoff. So then they started tapering people and uh, physicians were forcing patients to bring their doses down, often in the hundreds of milligrams of morphine equivalents a day, down to under 90. And then physicians, I was part of a mentoring group that was helping physicians who had been disciplined. And so they would reach out to me and say, I don't know what to do. I can't get this person under 120. They're going to come after me and take my license. And all of that was happening. And, and it was becoming impossible. People were kind of cornered. And then all of a sudden, a new movement came along and said, no, 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 no. People have a right to their euphoria. We need to be giving them these safe pills so they don't overdose on that dangerous fentanyl that's out in there in the street and it's very similar to the the narrative of no 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 we have to do this because it's life-saving you know this is a life-saving intervention because we believe it is um and so what happened was there was a swing towards tightening down and clamping down on physicians that happened in about 2010s and then suddenly we've swung and this is only happening in canada it hasn't happened in the states yet oh, you can cross your fingers that it doesn't um, this giant harm reduction movement that's now making it widely available. So it's now very patient driven again. So it, we've gone back towards what we've been looking at here with the, you know, the patient decides what's life saving for them. Yeah, I've said it a million times, I'm sure um, Mia and Carrie are yawning, but like it's moved from, you know, patient centered to, to patient led. And it's dangerous. It's it's consumer driven. You you know it's it's acting as if medicine is is a a shop where you buy your services. But some of these questions are very interesting. One, I do, you know, see if anybody has an answer to this. Is there any evidence historically that a change in government at the federal level will slow or temper the spread of the ideology? Anybody? You know, I, I think there there definitely is. Um, I know through people I've been in contact with, um, just through the nature of my case, that um, there's already policies being put in place that will prevent this from happening, prevent the spread, holding these people accountable. And for these children who are being sucked into this world, there's nothing more important than that. Uh, so I, I do believe, but then I also think that there's another really interesting historical um, correlation and you see that, it, I don't think there's many, um, you know, it's not necessarily medical, but rather legal. When you had, um, you know, mobs in like the 1920s, 30s, 40s, um, and then after that, when, when there was such a challenge to prosecute them, you know, to try to tie these organizations together, it was a federal-led effort in order to create RICO statutes in order to tackle this very challenging issue of criminal organizations. And so there is precedent with, with if you have the right administration, the right federal policy, you can craft, um, you know, federal, uh, you know, kind of um, legal statutes that can hold these people accountable. So I think that that really is an important thing. Whoa, that's very, very interesting. 
I didn't know that. I love this question. And uh, as somebody said, it's a fascinating and depressing conversation. I do think it is a little fascinating and depressing, but also incredibly necessary. I'm just thrilled to have actual doctors who are working in the, you know, in on the ground. I think there's something so important to for this. But one question comes in universities and the newly graduated cohort. Oh, it's jumped. Of course, it's jumped. Asking about the universities. Let me see it. Sure. Universities, the newly graduated cohort of physicians appear to be the root of the belief system that underpins this movement, which is a belief that, it, that in the idea that it is imperative or best to medically modify the body to match the psyche. How do we stop the ideas and universities? Now, I know that's not how to ask, you probably don't have to ask the doctors, but I think it's an interesting mark. Do you want to take it away and anybody else just unmute yourself? I think it's true. I think when you start studying gender, you realise you end up in universities and in academia and shoddy research. And the dog agrees. Um, well, you know, most of my teaching is with first and second year students, so they are fresh out of university. And it's very clear that they've uh, they've imbibed several strains. Many of them have taken gender courses. Uh, many of them have a sort of a social justice orientation, and they see uh, receiving gender affirming care as a civil right. Uh, and once you make it a civil right, then uh, issues like does it work? Does it actually reduce suicide? What does it do to depression? What's a 10-year complication rate? Become sort of irrelevant because it, it is a civil right. And there's also a great deal of identitarian feeling. Uh, yeah. I was trying to develop a, uh, a 15-hour course on gender medicine, and some of the more activist students told me that as a cis- hetero male, I'm really the wrong person to be teaching this course, or if I did presume to teach it, I should only teach the affirming model. Mark, how many students are receptive to skepticism? Are there any, or do they come to you privately? Um, I, I don't think most of them know who I am or where I am. When I teach my ethics course, which is not focused on gender medicine, I often ask the students afterwards, so how's your experience been in the school? Do you feel free to bring things up? And many of them say, well, I'm okay discussing controversial things with my classmates, but I wouldn't bring them up with administration and faculty. And others say, you know, uh, when I hear things that I cannot agree with, I tend to just let them pass because the social cost of saying something is too much. Whoa. It's frightening. I would just add to that that I have a close colleague in across the country who teaches uh, psychiatry residents and has recently been put on some form of probation and all kinds of disciplining or possible disciplining for teaching about exactly this and uh absolutely i would say it's the minority of whether they're of learners so whether it's medical students or residents it's absolutely the minority that are will well that are willing or even that are able to think that critically it that's my impression but i, I you know i'm only working in one sort of circle and hearing from a few other circles so i don't know how it works across the states but my sense in Canada is it absolutely the dominant narrative is is the one that that we're all sitting here and questioning. I, I'm in a different region because I'm, you know, in, in Ireland and I often give more and more and more. I get booked to give talks to clinicians, to kind of, you know, third year counselling students, to kind of groups effectively that are work in psychology and I'm finding them, the, the ground is very soft and they're very open. There will always be one or two fervent, but generally a huge amount of psychologically oriented. So I think it's like, I think it's a good deal different in England and Ireland than it would be in America and Canada. I can feel people saying no shit, Stella. <laughs> well, well, Stella, I, I do read about all sorts of people getting cancelled when they try to go into universities to express a 
wider view. Uh, many of them try to uh, assert women's rights for private spaces, for instance. And, uh, you know, it, it may cause a riot or they get canceled at some of the most prestigious universities. Yeah. And this is happening. So it's quite almost schizophrenic because this is happening. And then I'm giving these webinars and I'm finding it very easy. It feels like it's very definitely driven by if there's an active trans activist in the university or is allowed in the faculty, they rule, they rule. I've got a good friend who's working in a university and uh, effectively an, an activist has joined the department and has absolutely transformed the place since uh, the, the activist started in September. It absolutely transformed what was an easygoing place to being a fraught, conflict-ridden, filled with so, yeah, I, I think it very much depends. And I, I'm probably being booked by people who are just quietly just booking me. So it, it's dependent, you know. And I would I have read two books recently that I would strongly recommend for anybody who wants to understand this interaction between younger medical trainees and medical students and the older faculty or take it to corporations. They're, you know, 20, 30-something employees versus senior management. Uh, Greg Lukianoff is involved in both of them. The first is the coddling of the American mind, and the second is the canceling of the American mind. Oh, I haven't read the second one. I have read um, Jonathan Haidt's new book, The Anxious Generation. I think it's coming out next week. I did a review of it. Oh, my God, it's frightening and truthful. I'd also recommend in the context of tonight's conversation, uh, Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me, which has, it's not so much the whole book, but there's a particular chapter where they talk about physicians and, and a, a couple of medical examples of the way we perceive right versus wrong or that what we're doing makes perfect sense when in fact it might make it be perfect nonsense. Whoa. Mistakes were made but not made by me. I, I thought it was looking up but I think I, it's maybe Carol Tavris Williams, yeah and Elliot Aronson I actually just reread it because it's the most perfect book you can read for this point in the medical scandal how they're still managing to self-justify I think it's fascinating wow I didn't know about that Harry Carrie, are you on mute I was gonna say that might run into like there's an interesting quite a nice segue to us uh, Someone asked, do you think the New York Times will ever cover this story? <laughs> so just that kind of, you know, um, there's just certain segments of our society that are just locked into this. And we see there's these information silos. Like when I went to the American Academy of Pediatrics, the booth, there were doctors who just had never heard of pediatricians who had never heard of detransitioners. You know, so a lot of siloing in, of information. So I wonder what everyone thinks about Will the New York Times ever? Well, you know, I'll start it off with my files. Yeah, I'll start it off with my bit, and then I'm very keen to what everybody else. Thinks okay, the almost infamous at this stage, New York Times. I was very um, interested in what Helen Joyce, who had worked in the Economist, had to say. Had to say because she saw how how slow it was to change the Economist stance on the Iraqi war. And it 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 you know they they kind of knew that they were going to reverse, but it seemed to take them ten years to do this reverse, and it basically people had to retire, people had to leave, that they didn't yeah it didn't happen it wasn't a moral, we have got it wrong it was, um enough people have left that we can slide the other direction it was, it was very depressing and incredibly instructive, and frightening about how a newspaper can re 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 reverse. I've seen, um, we've kind of got our own little microcosm of the New York Times with the Irish Times. It's incredibly similar, same prestige and um, same kind of capture. And I noticed that they were printing an awful lot of um, readers' letters. And I thought that's an interesting and quite shrewd way to reverse the ship. It's like, it's not us, it's the public, if you follow me. And so I, I, I think that gives them an opportunity if you if you could continue with our letter writing, it, arguably that will give them an in if they're ever going to move. You look mad to speak, Mia, am I right? Well, if you read 
the comments whenever the New York Times does a, a an article on this issue either way the comments are overwhelmingly in our favor people do not support this even New York Times readers do not support what's happening to children so the New York Times they 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 keep they 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 have they have published some things they haven't touched WPATH files yet but they've they've dipped their toe into the water many times on this issue and so the the they're trying the they're writing their course but it's very it's, you, Helen is right it's going to be very very slow and because the Pamela Paul one right what was that amazing piece that Pamela Paul did that's her name not so long ago we think they may have used up their their gender critical quota for some time and they can't publish something else maybe so soon afterwards. So I don't know if they're going to pick this one up. Yeah. Um, do you want to speak, Laurie? Are you going to? Yeah, Stella, there's a question I, I, I oh, yeah. uh, maybe you can help me with because it's quite relevant to materials that Genspec's made available. I'm going to read it out. Um, I'm getting a lot of, a lot out of this experience. I'm a teacher in Ontario. And we are told by our school board that we have to lie to parents if their child wants to change their pronouns, get binders, packers, or change their names. I don't want to lie to parents, and I don't think we should teach children to keep secrets with other adults. I feel like we are lying to children, and as teachers, we should be sharing the truth. Some of what we are expected to say and go along with is not the truth. Uh, she's This person's also written, I am not sure what approach to take at school. Do I stand my ground and potentially become isolated or just go along with this dangerous kind of policy in education? So I wanted to read that because I know a lot of materials were made available or have been made available. I don't know about for the teachers though. It was more for the parents to take to the schools. No, we have we have some Jen's back if you look at the resources, we have a Canadian school policy, uh, which is a really F2 document and it's really well researched. It's a beautiful Piece of writing. I I didn't write it. Piece of writing, and um, we we do talk about things like why it's not appropriate to keep secrets from parents in schools, and why it's important to prioritize sex over gender, and how perhaps a third space is really the only option for these children if they've had puberty blockers and if they have a, you know a different they've a medicalized identity, but you can't really just presume that they could go into and the space of the opposite sex. So it's very, very well thought out. We've Canadian one, we've an American one, we've an Irish one, and we also have just general school guidances. I would say that it could be helpful to bring them in as an as an opener, as a conversation opener. There will be people who don't like it, but also, you know, you can book organisations like Jensburg to come and speak to the staff. We tend to speak to the staff and that's where there's so much more interest. The teachers generally want to teach geography or maths or English. And they have been just absolutely foisted. This gender has been foisted upon them. There'll always be one, two or three who are massively keen into it. The rest of them are rolling their eyes just thinking, I'm a geography teacher. I, I'm, I'm not interested in this. And I, I've, I've seen plenty of fads come and go. So that's who I'm speaking to when we do give those and they can be incredibly powerful. Any of those school staff talks can be really a huge amount. Somebody commenting there on the New York Times censoring the amount of comments, that can be actually a kind of dark comedy, watching the censoring of the comments. Would anybody like to comment any further about the New York um, You know, that, that question, um, yeah. that was from a teacher, right? Uh, yeah. you know, asking about whether she was going to speak yeah. up, you know, and I'll, you know, I'll just say, um, you know, if you're listening, I, I think you'll regret it every single day of your life if you don't, um, because you know, this is, these are your children. And if you don't do something that your children are going to be put into a dangerous situation. So, you know, that it's the right thing to do, but you're going to have to sacrifice something. But if you do it and you stand your ground and you refuse to get bullied, then you'll enter this entirely different world that is is so much better than the one you came from. It seems really scary and it seems really dangerous and you will have to sacrifice, but I can attest that it's much better on the other side. Yeah, can I just back that up, Eitan? I'm really glad you said that because 
I've worked over the years so often. I I started off non-anonymous. I've always been out. But I think it's much, the water is much warmer out than in. I think it's very scary when you're in and you're you're not out of the closet as such with your views. You're frightened. You read these stories. You get, your eyes get bigger and you get scareder and scareder. And then when you come out and you have your name and you just think, yeah, bound to people who say it's better. Yeah, yeah, I did little things, but actually it's easier. It's mentally significantly better when somebody comes out. I, I'm really glad you said that. Yeah, because you have to think that, you know, every day for the rest of your life, you're going to have to look your, yourself in the mirror. And if you think that you didn't do the right thing at this moment, then it's going to be very hard. And that eats away at people and and there's no way to avoid that so and there is a lot of people on the yeah. other side waiting yeah. with support with connections with introductions with kind of invitations that you won't have anticipated there, there is a lot of warmth on the other side yeah like uh, uh, you wouldn't even imagine it's amazing really yeah go on mark well i just want to say that Aton has all sorts of moral authority to say what he just did because he took a very brave step and he now has the United States Department of Justice after him. Uh, there was an earlier question we didn't really get to, which is what would the impact of a change in administration next year oh, be yeah. like? Uh, we, we didn't really touch that. Nobody really knows, but you look at the staffing of the the Biden White House, the assistant uh, secretary of health and human services uh, is transgender, but is a very militant uh, person and uh, very much devoted to pushing changes in policy through the military, the Veterans Administration, you name it. Uh, I'm not sure what Trump would do. I, I suspect that uh, you know, he might reverse that just because it was Biden who did it, and that would kind of fit his uh, modus operandi. But for whatever reason, I do think that would change things. We certainly see some changes elsewhere, like uh, I believe it's in Alberta right now. He yeah. has a political leader who is going to change the, the standards for gender medicine. Uh, likewise, in, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, one of the newly powerful parliamentary members says, we've got to do a systematic review. We're tired of being known as the place that invented the Dutch protocol. So political shifts do matter. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and, and right, and pol who holds the policy keys, it really matters. But to uh, you know, pick up on what was said about ethics, like I, that is how I felt during the opioid crisis the run-up of you know it, the pressure to prescribe i to me it was very clear i i just knew it was wrong i could never look myself in the mirror and knowing i would be contributing to someone's continued addiction or decline or overdose um and living with doing something unethical has has a huge huge cost so so for me during the opioid crisis it was never a question that i was going to say no what was so hard was that when i said no there were not a lot of people supporting me and that was a huge shock that was the first time i thought oh my gosh wait the how is the wouldn't the administration of the hospital want me to be saying no you know but then i found out well well no because they want they're just their metric is a is a result on a on a pain scale, not not the patient, you know, and that was really, really, you know, eye opening to me. And that was depressing and hard to work through to figure out how to find your place to practice medicine ethically and in a satisfying way. I think that's, you know, a big a separate conversation, a big challenge for the culture of medicine, which, you know, is, is part of, mm. I think the root causes where, why we would be susceptible to further scandals because physicians are atomized or, or they're, they're, it, you know, hospital employees and just different things. But the, the ethics, you, you know, you just, you have to realize like it, it is better to be consistent with, 
with ethics and there are wonderful people on the other side, you know, supporting in this situation, wonderful people supporting doing the right thing. And we just need to keep banding together and speaking out so people know that we're here. Yeah. Um, I see Dr. Gillian Spencer makes the comment. She She's um, no more than yourself, Eitan Haim. She, she spoke out in her hospital in, um, I know I'm going to get it wrong, Australia rather than New Zealand, I think. I was shocked at my, she said, I was shocked at my hospital. I thought we were all there to do the right thing. I think I found out that most people are there to pay their mortgage. I never thought people would cross the line of child protection. I think people slip. The, the, you know, the, it's it's kind of, you know, that analogy about the, the boiled frogs and it's it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter. It's like they, they you know what I mean? They, they, they kind of slip and slip and slip and suddenly they're le- leading a very unethical life if the culture of the hospital is unethical. So it really matters. But these are, you know, well-paid doctors who, who are, I presume, well-paid, but certainly they're in positions of extreme responsibility. It is, you know, very looked up to to this day. Um, is there any other questions that jump out of people? I like this one, of course I would. I'm a psychologist thinking about the applicability of the old concept of a folie à deux, which is a shared delusion among two or more people. This seems to be a good example of a large-scale delusion about the normality of this phenomenon and the medicalizing of a psychological and sociological problem. I think of, you know, Lisa Marciano wrote that amazing paper way back in 2017 about the Pied Piper and how we never, the Pied Piper is a true story from the 13th century in the village of Hamelin and I think Denmark or somewhere. And we never found out what happened, but some man came and took all the children and the children left the town. And this extraordinary mass delusion that has occurred, and we've, we've learned it Time and again, you know, the Stanley Milgan kind of experiments, people fall in with the the way of thinking. There's not that many, you know, as far as I can see, it's about 10 to 15 percent of people who speak, who go against the crowd. Everybody else just goes with it. And then that 10 or 15 are arguing which way to go. You know, <laughs> some are going one way and some are going the other. It's frightening, but I, I think that this is a mass delusion. I think this is the, it's, and it's not the first and it's not the last that I've lived through. What do anybody else think that? Yeah, you know, I, I think the, it's like the story of the human condition because we've seen it so many times. It's, it's, it's more of like when has the human race and our society acted responsibly? And, you know, there's been times where we've really gotten it right. Um, you know, but of course, you know, these, these, Good times lead to weak people, and then weak people lead to bad times. Um, but I think that it's the first step is just understanding that what this really is, that this is like this mass delusion. And if if you can't acknowledge that, then you can't acknowledge the steps that have to be taken to reverse it. Because for the average person, uh, you know, it seems so far-fetched what's going on. I mean, like I, I it just through the nature of my case, I would talk to big, so some, some donors in the conservative movement. And you would think that they would be knowledgeable about what's going on, but they have no idea. And these are people who are really plugged in, but like, they're not even aware that this whole thing is going on because it's so crazy. So like the first step is acknowledging what's happening. It's, it's crazy to see that people who you think would know, don't even know. And could you remind people just about your case? Because we've uh, quite a few people listening on Twitter and on YouTube. And just in case anybody who doesn't know you, just to... Yeah, I um, I blew the whistle on Texas Children's Hospital because they had lied about their um, quote-unquote gender-affirming care program. They said they shut it down. They didn't. Uh, I exposed it with a journalist who named Christopher Rufo. A month later, on the day of my graduation, the federal agents came to my apartment and informed me I was under criminal investigation. So then after that, you know, we experienced the full extent of the corruption within the Department of Justice. So now, you know, I decided to go public because the corruption was so severe. And we're actually pursuing an investigation into them. So that's that's our goal is to, um, you know, hold these people accountable to the greatest degree possible. Good for you. Good for you. Um, do you want to come in on something, Carrie? I see a question. Is there something you want to come in? I just think 
that's amazing and you should be applauded and you're the kind of doctors we we need coming into the system so thank you for for doing that but you know i will say that there's i guarantee you there's probably hundreds of people dozens of people listening to this who are in the same position right like they can do the same thing because they know something's going on at their hospital that's like very criminal or very unethical and all they have to do is send a couple emails get in touch with someone and the whole thing blows up i mean hopefully they don't get criminally investigated yeah, that sucks. But, <laughs> you know, um, there's good ways to do it. So, and, and if anyone does need to, just email me. Um, yeah. That's what astonished me, Aitan, because I remember when we had you on the podcast and you said you were writing email for something like six months before you found us as a community. You know what I mean? You, you were really eager to do this and you weren't getting anywhere. And I was, we all think that we're so ready for all this am i right it was something like six months you were right yeah yeah yeah. five months five and a half months um yeah yeah it, it's like this world it's it's like um like uh what, what laurie and mark were saying where it's like you have these like young people controlling the nature of of medicine like kind of like the cultural revolution in china in the 1960s that like we feel so atomized that we feel like there's no world out there that can possibly exist and then even when you start reaching out, it's hard to, to even get a story out there, you know? Amazing. We, we, we're in our own echo chambers. I see, seeing one comment, it reminds me of a, a comment I'll tell you in a second. One person says, until hearing this webinar, I would think it was naive to believe people don't know about detransitioning. If you can tr transition, you can detransition. I always knew that. I don't understand the cognitive dissonance behind these doctors, but I will call my doctor only because you persuaded me to. I'll call tomorrow. Thank you. Please do. Oh, that's great. That was the response to my response, I think, because somebody had posted and I was privately answering. That's good news. Thank you. You do that. <laughs> I, I want to back that up because I remember I was uh, I was studying. I was doing a course. I'm always doing courses. And uh, the professor, I said something, blah, blah, blah. And I said, detransition. And he went, you could hear him. And he skipped a beat and he said, I know about transitioning detransitioning and he said in front of everybody and I was like seriously we forget people he had literally never heard of it until that moment and I was astonished that he hadn't heard of it I was literally astonished so you wouldn't know really yeah and, uh, and again when we went to the American Academy of Pediatrics at a booth I mean, we there were so many pediatricians with such a great response. They, they wanted to learn, but they had only kind of, most of them had the whole like, well, I refer to a gender clinic and is doesn't this, you know, help kids decrease suicide? So when we talked with them and shared the information, you know, there's misdiagnosis, there's comorbidities not being addressed. We had 150 books we passed out, some Estella's books, um, Time to Think parents with inconvenient truth about trans this whole world they weren't even aware of and like i said a few pediatricians had never heard of detransitioners pediatricians who are referring patients to to gender clinics so yeah but of course they wouldn't have because they age out of care like the I, pediatricians don't see them after 18 i guess I, mean, I mean maybe it's because I practice emergency medicine. And so obviously it's like the world of where things, things your people are there because things are going wrong, but, and for other reasons that are non-emergent, but to think when you practice medicine, that you would think that there's some entity where you're doing something to a patient and there's never like an adverse effect or, yeah. or an yeah. outcome you know, measure, I, I feel like that they change I, like just that it's disconnected from how everything else is in medicine. I feel like that's the part that's hard to understand, well, right? If it can treat you, if it can help you, of <laughs> course, if it can harm you. Like, right. Yeah. Right. Very good point. Well, and I've always said the onus should be on the intervention, not on proving that the intervention is harmful. This happens also with the safer supply opioid thing where you're just going to start throwing hydromorphone tablets out into the community because they're all being sold because they're not strong enough anyway to replace the fentanyl that people are using. That's the intervention. The intervention, if there's a chance that it's harmful, which we know there is because we've already done the opioid crisis once, we don't need to do it again. 
then the onus should be on the interventionists first. Because Very you're you're funny. taking a you know you're taking a, a a let's call it a neutral or relatively healthy community and you're intervening in that population. It makes no sense. The whole you know it turns medicine inside out and basically dismantles the uh, you know <laughs> the 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 vows that we take. Well, yeah, it's it's Bertrand Russell's chocolate teapot, you know, circling around the earth. You know what I mean? You 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 you've got to prove that it doesn't. You 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 know what I mean? The 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 proof, the, the, the onus of proof is on the person who's yeah, I get it. And before we finish, we're going to finish up in a, in a couple of minutes. And so make sure if you've any past last points around the W Path files, around ethics, around being a doctor in this world. But I just want to um because I think it's a very interesting point. Um, somebody has asked, is there any studies about what happens if a natal female goes on and off testosterone? Like one year on, one year off. Would it be better or worse for the body that being on t- than being on T all the time? I want to point out a couple of things. There's a lot to be gained from, I forget the name of that book. It's about the German uh, women who... Uh, oh, so- Faust Gold. Yeah, Faust, Faust Gold. Gold. I, it's right behind me. <laughs> I'll have it there, yeah. <laughs> Klaus Gold is quite interesting about, you know, testosterone yeah. on females and it's very objective. Stats for Gender is uh, the person to contact. Like, she, you know, she works for, for Genspect and Stats for Gender is its own Twitter account now as well. But certainly she's very enthused by, you know, I work with her. And we, we, we look for things to study to get the stats on, if you follow me. So you go and haunt us and we'll go and try and get the stats but it's a good point because I think more and more it's like it's become a recreational drug. Um, myself and Sasha were talking the other day that there was, you know, this the, this girl at a party offered testosterone and took testosterone at the party. It's like it's 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 ext- took her friend, you know what I mean, drug. It's like it's become something that's become just a cultural drug. So there's going to be an awful lot of on and off, on and off. I'd rather on and off than on all the time, personally. And I think on and off means there's some sort of movement happening. But the doctors might tell me better because I don't know. Well, yeah, none of it should be abused, but it does to me. I've talked about that, too. This feels like a subset of what's going on is a new class of drug of abuse, for examples you highlighted, and that there's already a lot of street selling of the medicines and then just sort of uh doping to kind of get an effect to get high which is do why i think prescription drug monitoring is is sort of the ethical thing to do in my opinion it might you know but i think there's an element of this that is here to stay in terms of a drug of abuse situation i'm curious what the other other folks think you know it strikes me as odd that um, testosterone would be used in this way as um, like a drug of abuse at a party because at least the traditional party drugs make you feel good and you can like dance and have a good time, you know, but like what testosterone does is just make you grow hair and I lower know. your voice. It seems must- like, a, like a major bummer, you know? And it's, it's, it's kind of a bonding, I think, between them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's why I imagine, but it's, it's uh, how world how crazy things have become that that is a bonding thing that people do at parties just blows my mind. Me too. Well, once upon a time, we could understand transgenderism, as they called it then, as a group of men who wanted to be as female as possible or vice versa. But they were still working within a sort of a sex binary. We now have a lot of people declaring a non-binary status or they're on some gender journey And they have what WPATH calls embodiment goals. And there are people who will tell you, I want testosterone to give me a deep voice, but not a beard, or vice versa. Or, yeah, I I want breast surgery, but we'll leave the genitals alone. So they can wind up in all sorts of different ways because it is the consumerist model. There's a sort of a Chinese menu, and you choose what you want. Wow. And, you, know, you know, it's it's such a good point because you see, like, when things start going off the rails in these conversations in the WPATH files, that uh, conference, that's when they bring up the embodiment goals, right? When people are like, oh, well, you know, I don't want to be necessarily male or female. I, I just want to this attribute or that attribute. So 
it's um, the exact opposite of what they do is then create some uh, pseudo scientific you know jargon to justify their you know um, movement forward in a very irresponsible way. Yeah, absolutely. It's frightening, really, what's happening. There's one last question. Uh, you might know the answer, um, Mia. Is there any Dutch clinicians left in WPATH? I think Thomas Steensma is still in this, is it? I, uh, I assumed that most of the original ones were still in there. I, is the WPATH member search back up? You it know what down? I think? I think... Um, it's it's important just to distinguish that the WPATH files, a lot of the content was from the listserv, right? Which is, uh, like if people know what a listserv is, it, it, yeah. it it's a group of usually, well, we, I, I'm familiar with listservs as a group of medical professionals who, you know, provide support to each other and, and share cases and, and issues. And so the WPATH listserv, the impression would be that that's what it is, a clinical listserv. But in fact... If I've ever seen any of the Dutch, I mean, I've met De Vries and Steensma, but I, I, I don't remember ever seeing them post or respond, but I have seen the odd, like maybe a social worker or a mental health counselor or, or somebody with experience of their own who's posting because there's a lot of people with lived experience who participate in the listserv as, as an expert because they have the lived experience and that's assumed to be expertise which again is what we see with opioids as well yeah and a listserv is basically a, a place Email. where members can go to a platform for members to go to to speak to each other um what was i going to say yeah but if you were a, a clinician with any credibility and you saw the w path files come out and you read Mia's report, I think most people would say, yeah, it's time to get out of Dodge City here, I think. Arguably. We better, we better finish it at, um, at this. Unless anybody wants to make a last uh, comment, you're, you're very welcome to if you want. Some lovely, you know, great kind of um, numbers again this week. There's nearly 700 in the, in the Twitter space and 100 in the, uh, in the YouTube and another 120, 116 in the uh, webinar so it's good good turnout thank you very much for everybody for for coming next week we're going to have the lovely eliza and monda green and writers the writers because mia you like you know so many people comment on how beautifully written your report is really beautiful it really does um reflect very well on your on your writing skills so it's 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 going to be a a, a different take on it next week um, does anybody want to say anything last just before we finish? Anything last to say about the Shubli Path files or anything? Just unmute yourself if you want. You know, I, I think too, um, <clears throat> the way the W Path files were read, especially because it was such a big file, uh, there was so much to cover. Uh, that's one thing that really stood out was that how uh, amazingly it was put together. Um, because, you know, it, it would have been so easy for that to, to just get lost. Um, so, you know, I think it's amazing you were on this, this conference because, uh, yeah, you're like a legend, you know, in like the future when they write books about this, there's going to be like a whole chapter on the W path files. It's going to be like Mia Hughes, you know, all the rest of the story is, yes, yeah, it's amazing. So. Thank you. That's lovely of you to say. I, it, it, it's so true. And I want to just plug like Jen Speck's, uh, Twitter handle that is going to every day post. Oh, yeah. Just go through systematically um, each each file, each vignette, and post it one a day because there is so much there, you know, and uh, it, it it's just important to make sure the information is out there. So look at Jen Speck's uh, Twitter handle um, because we're going through it every single day. <laughs> and when you're tired, when you're tired of looking at what not to do, you can mosey on over to the NHS, the new NHS documents oh, yeah. on the NHS we website, right? And and start working your way through a possible path out of this. So um, if this people aren't aware of what's happening in Europe and what's happened in the UK, that's very important. Go to the NHS website. The cast review is coming out in a week or two. We we have to have some you know, light at the end of this tunnel. Great point. Could be very well out by this time next week. So 
tune in and see us next week. I see somebody's going, trying to translate the report into Spanish. Please do. We look forward to all the translations. And thank you all very, very much for coming. Thanks for to, to everybody for their questions and all that. And we might see you next week. Um, another really fascinating, really, really good webinar. Thanks a million.